Um, David, it's really nice to meet you in person, given that we've spoken a lot of the time over the internet and never in real life. So it's good to be here with you. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, Sender has been around for many years. It's one of the household names in German tech. Um, it was founded in 2015 and now has a thousand employees across eight countries. So it's a pretty big company. So you've seen the kind of highs and lows of the last eight years. Um, and speaking of which, you know, we've just come out of this boom cycle where VCs were chucking a lot of money at a lot of companies. Um, do you think that becoming a unicorn and you know, raising this one billion valuation, is that still as significant a status symbol as it was before? Or are there different priorities, would you say? So I'd like to answer this question first by addressing the um, status symbol topic and then the need of unicorns for the system to work. Status symbol will stay status symbol. Uh, if you take a Ferrari as a comparison, even if it's a more shabby Ferrari and you don't have the money to get the spare parts, it still stays a status symbol. Uh, and I think uh, now it might take a bit longer, it's more difficult to get to that status symbol, but it will re remain one. But I think the most important thing is to understand that the startup scene needs unicorns. And to understand why, you, ha you have to realize that venture capital firms bet on, on average 30 companies per fund, if you take an early stage fund, and they need two to three to be a unicorn or a decacorn. Otherwise, the economics of the fund do not make sense. They rather see 28 fail or do so-so and two or three succeed big time, like as a unicorn, uh, then the other way around, have 28 doing on average and three failing. And this is why we will continue to see unicorns as start, uh, venture capital firms will be funding what they think is, are gonna be unicorns in the future. So when um, founders are going to VCs, how should they be pitching themselves right now? Like, do they need to pitch themselves as they have been doing, which is, we're gonna raise a billion in nine months or whatever, or do they have to come across as if they're being a bit more risk averse? I think it's important to distinguish between early stage and late stage. Early stage startups still have to position themselves as a company that can get to the unicorn status. And they still have to sell a big dream. Of course, they have to be a bit more careful, plan for more runway, and at least have two, if not three years, to figure out the next round instead of the 12 months that maybe we had uh, one and a half or two uh, years ago. For later stage startups, it's more tricky. If they have to raise, they typically have a problem unless they, uh, they are in the AI space or in a very special space. And um, so they have to optimize more for profitability and then the entire story is uh, how quickly can I get there and how profitable will, will the company be then uh, thereafter. Yeah, I want to go on and talk a bit more about profitability and strategies for getting there in a bit. But um, other than the fundraising challenges right now, which I think are pretty well documented, also probably by Sifted, um, what other obstacles are companies facing right now in this environment and how do you think they should be adapting to these? I think other than fundraising, getting the right talent is one of the biggest challenge uh, we have. Keeping the talent and bringing also the talent back into the office. Um, uh, we, not only Sender, but I think a lot of companies still don't find the people they really need. And uh, this is, remains a big challenge. Bringing it back to the office is one of the things that we tried a couple of times and we're struggling. Yeah, we offer three days in the office, two days remote. Now, yeah, we, we have a, an adherence of 60, 70%, so getting there. Um, so that's another big challenge. Interesting to see is that our Berlin and Amsterdam office are the two offices where we struggle the most to bring people back to the office. Eastern European offices and Southern European offices, it's much, much easier. And if you would ask me why I think that's the case, I think that in Amsterdam and Berlin, there are more alternatives as a big tech company that offers all the perks, then maybe in Eastern Europe, in Wroclaw, just a few hundred kilometers from here, there are not too many companies, and when we ask employees to come back, uh, it just works a bit uh, better than, than here, but that remains a big challenge as well. Do you have like incentives that you're giving to people to come to the office, or are you just trying to like give this um, message that for your company being in the office is the better? 
we alternative. Have, we have a lot of benefits. We have everything from free food, um, napping rooms, a gym here in Berlin, a PlayStation, a beer tab, a rooftop, even napping rooms. Um, but that's not. So you're giving them sufficient. everything, but they still don't want to come back, basically. No, I'm joking. Um, speaking then about profitability, obviously you've gone on this journey the last eight years and profitability is, I'm sure, something that you've also thought about. Um, what are the kind of levers that companies have to pull in order to become more profitable or at least have like an idea of how they can get there? I think it very much depends on the companies. I think most of the B2C companies that use marketing to fuel growth that's the first thing that you look at. We do not have any um, uh, marketing that we do. We are B2B, uh, big enterprise uh, sales, uh, so we don't have that. What we do is uh, we slow down our geographic expansion, for example, and do not open as many offices as we perhaps uh, uh, did before. We also stop doing a lot of business models that can complement our core business model, which is just trucking brokerage services, fuel cards, insurances, all cool things that at least within Senda even sound more fun than maybe the core of what we do. Something that we parked and said, we now have to get to profitability with our core. And when we get there, we can open up again these, uh, let's say, interesting opportunities. I kind of feel like, um profitability and growth are always like pitted against each other as like you can't be profitable and grow at the same time but what's what's your take on that it's not a good story if you're profitable and you don't grow yeah so you always have to find the the the, the, the trade-off at the end of the day startups that get money from vc need to deliver an exit sooner or later and to do a good exit um uh, you have to show growth, especially if you want to do an IPO. So I think the tricky part is really finding the right balance and also securing the financial resources to uh, support the balance uh, uh, that, that you find. Um, uh, if, you, if you're just profitable but you're not growing, or even, even worse case, you're decreasing in sales, what's next? It's very difficult to raise around, even when you know, the market might be back for fundraising at later stage. And also the equity story for an IPO wouldn't be there, so it would be very tricky. Um, so you have to find the right balance, um, and this is why uh, some companies have to secure a little bit more funding to support exactly that balance and keep the growth story interesting. But if you're kind of like stopping the fun things, as you put it, to focus more on core product, not doing too much expansion into other markets perhaps, like where are the opportunities for growth? And obviously that depends a lot on like the business model and the individual company in its sector, but like how can companies kind of analyze where are the best ways to grow? So I can, I can tell you how we do it. Um, we focus more on what we do best, uh, which is serve big enterprise shippers such as Coca-Cola. We have a small wallet share and we put our attention to increase that wallet share as much as we can. And to do that, it's management attention, it's product attention, it's quality attention that you focus on your biggest shippers, in our case, our biggest customers, and try um, to expand that. But I have to admit that if you ask me what the atmosphere now is in the company, since we focused on, let's say, more the core, the less fun things, you, you can notice a difference. I think uh, it, it's not only with Senda, but a lot of companies. It's more fun to keep on opening new countries, expanding new markets, um, hiring a lot, um, trying you know, cool business models that can complement the core. It just gives a different energy to the company. Right now, it's heads down. Get the things that we know we're doing well uh, right and, uh, and do them even better. Grow our wallet share. And that changed a little bit the overall sentiment in the company, but I think this is part of the journey. And also a new phase, a different phase, where I'm personally also learning a lot. We spoke a little bit earlier about how kind of, you know, early stage founders now, or maybe first time founders, maybe need to have like a little bit of a reality check about the fact that you cannot raise money on 2021 terms, right? But do you think that this era of exponential growth 
um, is over? Like, is it not going to come back for another 10 years? Like, what is your feeling? I wonder what I would have answered in 20, 2002 after the dot-com uh, bubble. Probably would have said, hmm, tricky, maybe not. But I think the venture capital uh, industry, like many others, are very, is very cyclical. Um, and I'm pretty sure that it's more of a question of time until we go back to an environment where it's more exciting to invest into startups. I think um, interest rates have to get down. So the comparables, the alternatives to venture capital investing have to become less attractive than they are today. And this will take some time. But I believe that in the next couple of years, um, uh, we're going to see what we have seen over the past 30, 40 years. Um, uh, the interest for, for technology uh, companies and since 20 years tech startups will come back and uh, we're going to see probably another hype sooner later or later. But if fundraising is a little bit more scarce and maybe we're not seeing as many unicorns crowned as we did in 2021, does that mean that in the meantime we need different metrics for success rather than I've raised X amount of millions for my company at X amount of valuation? Absolutely. I think whether you're early stage, especially when you're later stage, growth, especially revenue, top line growth, it's not on any longer the metric to focus on. It's still an important one. As mentioned earlier, if you flatten down or decrease, it's very tricky to raise money or to do an exit that is interesting. And the other metrics that are important is efficiency, um, profitability, and the unique, the fundamental part of the unique economics um, are becoming more and more important. And that's what we also focus on. We also actively decided not to expand into new countries, not to overly expand into new shippers, new customers, where we have unique economics that improve only further down in the lifetime. We said we're going to focus um, on profitability by penetrating the wallet share of the shippers that we already have, where we know how to make a lot of money, um, and uh, yeah, focus on that. I just want to dwell quickly on this title, is growth about growing up? And obviously you've gone from the early stages through to the later stages. So as you grow, is there some kind of mentality change that happens? Absolutely. Um, but the best way to answer this is I realize that maybe one day I'm not any longer the right person to lead the company. And when I started my, my two co-founders a few years ago, I always thought, well, the three of us will co-lead and co-manage this company until we sell it one day. And reality is that at, at a certain point, there's one that has to take the role of the CEO to take the last shot. And this means that the relationship and also the, uh, the maturity of the individuals evolve potentially differently. And then um, the complexity that gets added every time you grow, you add a new uh, uh, office, a new country, is exponential. And if you look around, how many unicorn founders are still really in the chair of the CEO? They take other fancy roles. And statistically speaking, I would say that it's more likely that at a certain point, I'm not any longer the right one than being, you know, than, 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 uh, that this is likely. I still feel like um, I'm the right one, um, and I'm, I'm looking, I hope that I can have you know, this chair and this responsibility for a long time. But over the different phases, I realized that yeah, the complexity of organization grow exponentially, and people's ability to manage and understand complexity is more linear. And it's not because you lack the motivation, the energy, the brain power, it's just because your brain is a muscle and doesn't have enough time to train and understand that complexity. The way I like to picture is, is that it's like a universe where you have stars, moons, and suns. And every time you grow, the universe becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. As a first-time founder, I have to have a 360-degree understanding of the universe. If I take out a sun, I have to understand what is the impact on the moon that is back there. And that's why I need to have the 360. And the bigger the universe gets, the more difficult it is to have this picture. If you take someone that would potentially replace me, or if you take someone also from my management, that have, uh, someone that has 20, 30 years more experience than I do, they had 
they have seen this complexity, this universe, and had time to understand it. And they might don't even not see the little uh, moon that is back there, but because out of experience, they know nothing is going to break if that moon moves or even you know, uh, flies out of your universe, they can manage um, uh, the, the company um, yeah, or what they do um, uh, in, a, in a very good way. And the question is, until when am I capable of yeah, understanding the universe, taking the right decision? Um, and that's something that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think about a lot. I said I would love to keep this um, uh, uh, role for another few years, but statistically speaking, I think it's, uh, it's a question of time. But I hope that I see the IPO. I like this solar system metaphor. Very nice. I think we're going to go to questions. Alvaro, there's a question over there. I'm not sure whether we slide on. Okay. Um, which one would you like to take? That's someone that asks, why are you so fixed on employees going back to the office? And another one says, is growing up also about growing the industry and thus growing chance of the ecosystem to thrive? Rising tides lift all boats. Was that correct? I can't really see. <laughs> Which one do you want to take? You choose. Um, let's, take, let's take the second one. The growing up about growing the industry and thus growing the chance of the ecosystem to thrive. Let's do that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think oh, it's also there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think I, I took a lot from the Berlin and German startup ecosystem when I started. Uh, mentoring, support, the first business opportunities with companies from the ecosystem that gave me a chance. So I think it's definitely about um, uh, giving back once you grow up. And this is why, as an example, my co-founder and I, um, we do some angel investment and we do that, of course, also eventually for the financial return, but uh, the fun part of it is to give back, to talk about things such as um, how do you solve conflicts among co-founders? How do you talk about or discuss a salary raise with your investors? Do you do that just before a round, just after a round? It's tricky. When is the right time to talk about a top up of maybe shares or VOPs? Uh, these kind of things are, are things that uh, I like doing because I know how difficult it is and how much I struggled. And that's why I definitely think that it's, uh, when you grow up, it's, uh, you have to give back to the ecosystem. So there's like a responsibility there then, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for. Thank you.